Well, hey, everyone, welcome back as we continue this sermon series called On the Road Again, Finding God in the Unexpected Journeys. As we've been saying over the last couple of weeks, that it's usually the unexpected journeys that yield the most growth in our lives. We're forced to be put in a new situation, in new circumstances that we can't control or predict. And what happens is we end up maturing, we end up developing, we end up responding in real time with our faith. And so actually it's sometimes these unexpected journeys are the source of our biggest blessings when it comes to our relationship with God. And we're using this idea of being on the road again with God, sort of like a a summer vacation or a, a trip that you're planning. Is it just like a vacation or I think to in our lives, we set up markers, little push pins in the map, and we judge our success by them. We judge our success by how far we've gotten. Have we hit those markers that we had planned out for ourselves? And so many times we don't, or we end up on a completely different path than what we expected. And the danger is, is we might feel like we've failed. Maybe we've failed personally. Maybe we've even failed spiritually because we're not where we thought we would be by a certain point in time. Well, I think what this series is helping me to do, and hopefully it's helping you to do, is to rethink that. To think about, well, you know what, maybe I just am where I am, and God, I'm not too far away from the journey that God wants me on. I'm maybe just one moment with God away from being back on the journey that he has for me, that probably unexpected journey that we didn't see coming, but it's exactly what we need. Or maybe even more accurately, it's exactly what we didn't know we needed, <laughs> but we needed. And, and this is what it boils down to, and we t- we're talking about this last week, is that when you get on the road with God, when you follow him on these unexpected journeys, it usually comes from a place of being close with God and you're hearing his voice in a, in a more intense or a more clear kind of way. And what we're saying last week is once you know who you are, your journey becomes more and more clear. And that's just how it works. Once you know who you are, once you get your sense of identity, then it's a lot easier to then, then work toward well, what is my work? What am I going to do? And that's what we talked a bit about last week because clarity comes from closeness with God. Clarity comes from closeness with God. And when we get clear about what God's saying to us, about what he says about us, what he wants for us, then our journey begins to unfold, the journey that he wants us to take. God on top of that mountaintop, we were saying. It's like being on a mountaintop with God, this time of closeness. That it, God reminds us who we are and whose we are in that process. So, and, and listen, both, believe me, both are going to be tested as you descend the mountain. When you get on to the work that God has for you, when you get on to that unexpected journey, both who you are and whose you are will be tested, just like it was for Jesus. Today, we're talking about, okay, you're, you're on this road You know that you're going to be tested, but what happens when the people in your life, maybe even the people that you are closest to, are the doubters? What happens when they're the ones who are the detractors? What happens when they actually become part of the opposition party to what God wants to do in your life? It actually happens more than you might realize. It's quite common, but usually when it happens, it's like we don't even know what to do with ourselves because, man, these are the people that... They're supposed to be with us through thick and thin, no matter what. And it seems like when we get spiritually close with God, when we get kind of dialed in, sometimes that's threatening to the people who matter most to us. I'm showing you this picture of when I was about 15 years old. That's me and my family. That's my mom, my stepdad, Paul, my brother, and my sister. And that was the summer that we moved from California to New Jersey. Now, we looked really happy in this picture, as should all good family photos. (laughs) But there was a lot of currents going on under the surface of that picture. There was some real heartache. My stepdad was struggling. Uh, He was struggling with uh, alcoholism, with uh, drug dependence, with pain from his own past. My mother there, though she's standing in the picture, she had multiple sclerosis, and we were actually literally propping her up. Uh, because by that time, she had almost completely needed to be in a wheelchair. And then uh, my brother and sister and I. 
And when I look at that picture, I look, somebody on the outside would say, man, that family's got it all. They got it all together, this young, happy family. They're all smiling. What could possibly going wrong, <laughs> be going wrong in their lives? And the answer was absolutely everything. And my family wasn't particularly religious at all. They would fall into that category, spiritual but not religious. My mom and stepdad had some church kind of upbringing a little bit. And every once in a while, there would be some, I, I would say, looking back, some seeds of faith that never went anywhere. They never grew. They just kind of lay dormant in the ground. And as I look back at this picture, too, and I think about everything that happened from that date forward, I'm reminded that me as a father with a young family, don't wait for my kids to grow up to make sure that I'm giving them the spiritual guidance that they need. Because, man, did we need it. We needed it so badly. In fact, a lot of us, you know, my brother, sister, and I, um, we deal with a lot of baggage from those years that if we had had maybe some spiritual help, things would have been different. I don't know. It's hard to speculate. But the bottom line is, four years after that picture was taken, is that I found myself on a literal mountaintop around a campfire at summer camp. And I'm 19 years old, and I just had this transforming experience with Jesus Christ. I accepted him. And you, there's a lot of different language you could use around that. Um, some would say I got saved in that moment. Some would say that I came to faith. Whatever it was, my heart was transformed on the mountaintop. And I was told for the first time who I really was and whose I really was, and it changed everything. But then I went home. I went home to my not religious family, and things did not go like I had hoped. I was so excited to share my new faith with them, and I was told in no uncertain terms that my faith was not allowed in the house. I was not allowed to talk with my younger brother and sister about it. I was basically asked to not be the new person that God made me, but to revert to the old person that everybody knew. Was it because it was safer? Yeah. They knew that Jason. This new Jason, they didn't know what to do with. It also, I'm sure, awakened something in them. Maybe it was a guilt for not feeling close to God. Maybe it was all sorts of spiritual baggage that they had or baggage about church. But the, it, this was one of the most profoundly sad things that ever happened to me was here I am, I have this mountaintop experience, transforming experience with God, and the people who I love the most are not on board. And in fact, are hating. <laughs> They're the haters in this situation. And here's the truth. Sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, you won't have the support from the people that you love the most. And the only solace that I was ever able to take was that that's the same thing that happened to Jesus. There's a story about Jesus going to his hometown to do ministry, and everybody's turning to each other and like, isn't that the carpenter's kid? Like, they, like, what do you mean? What do you mean this guy is something special? We saw him grow up. There's something about ministry in your own family that's probably the hardest thing that you'll ever do. Why? Because they know you. They saw you grow up. And now who do you think you are telling me this, this and that about God? Who do you, where do you get off uh, claiming to know something about God? It's a tough situation. Today I want to share a story with you about um, a similar situation from a Bible character named Joseph. Joseph was Jacob's son, and you might know him probably more famously from Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, right? <laughs> a, that's what he's famous for, Andrew Lloyd Webber plays, but he was famous even before that, believe me. He was given by Jacob uh, a coat of many colors, it says. And the whole reason that he received this coat was because it was a sign of his dad's favor. His dad favored him amongst his other brothers. And this naturally caused some resentment in the family, caused some resentment amongst his brothers. But more than that, as Joseph grew, he, he reached a point where he started having these dreams. And his identity began to be Joseph is that kid who dreams. He's a dreamer. He has these dreams, and they turn out to be prophetic dreams. He didn't know it at the time. Dreams given by God. And once he starts dreaming and sharing the results of his dreams, his brothers become incredibly resentful. They become really angry with him. They plot against him, and they decide that he needs to go. They're so threatened by these dreams. Now, part of it is the dreams themselves sound threatening to them. Like, what does it mean? It means that 
Uh, he's saying something true about God and that we might lose our place in line. We might lose our favor completely. He's already the favored one. Now you're telling me, you know, he's the favored, favored one. He's the one who also dreams things before they happen. Give me a break. This scripture here now from Genesis 37 is the story of what happens next, beginning with verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Israel by this point, Jacob started going by Israel. That's a whole nother story. Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Oh, man. When God speaks an identity into your life, that's usually the first thing that's ridiculed by people who um, don't believe in you. Again, this was the same thing that we saw in Jesus. You know, if you are the son of God, Satan says to him. An immediate challenge to the identity. This happens with Joseph too. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Here's the truth. And I think we learned this from Joseph's story. Is The first thing is that sometimes we will be resented for our identity. We will be resented. I don't know if that helps, but it maybe helps set the expectation that not everybody is going to be warm fuzzy about spiritual transformation that's happening in our lives. And I think what happens is people get a little bit threatened by it. It makes them uncomfortable. If you've ever been around somebody who's really confident in who they are, not arrogant, but just really strong and confident, it can be intimidating. It can make you feel like insecure about your own confidence. Now, when you get confidence from the Lord about who you are, that makes people really, really insecure. So just know that going in. Sometimes we'll be resented for our identity. But here's the really hard part. I think we could live with the first part if that's all it was, but the second part is often it's from our own family. Oftentimes it's from our own family. And this was true certainly in Joseph's case. So his brothers plot to kill him. Hopefully your family never gets that far. <laughs> but his brother's plot to kill him, and one of his brothers at the last minute says, whoa, 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 we shouldn't kill him. We should show mercy to him. Okay, fine, we won't kill him. So they come up with this other elaborate plan to sell him into slavery and uh, frame it in such a way that it looks like he was killed by ferocious animals. So like they put blood on his uh, garments and they bring it back to dad. Jacob and they say oh look you know isn't it sad what happened and so he thinks his son is dead and they end up they sell him to slavery and he gets caravaned off to Egypt which is wonderful foreshadowing about what God's going to do to deliver slaves from Egypt but the brother Solomon and you know what happens when he's in Egypt so here he is talk about unexpected journeys this is a forced unexpected journey (laughs) he did he wasn't even following God on he was just taken to and you think man has that derailed everything that God wanted for him. Has that derailed his journey? Because sometimes it feels like it when we get on those kind of journeys that maybe it's all derailed. And you know what happens? He becomes a, a slave, a servant in this household in Egypt, and he flourished anyway. He becomes head servant. So much so that the master trusts him with absolutely everything in the house. And you think, wow, he's really, he's really made it. The Lord has really given him favor. In fact, it says this in his story. The Lord favored him during this time. Then, I'll just, I'll be very quick about this. The master's wife frames him for something, falsely accuses him, and he ends up going to prison. So, it's bad enough. He's sold into slavery. He, He flourishes anyway, is falsely accused and put in prison. You know what happens then? He flourishes anyway. 
he becomes well-known among the prison guard. He becomes beloved. He becomes favored even in the prison. And what happens is two Egyptian officials get imprisoned and he ends up doing what? Interpreting dreams for them. Here he is, back into his identity in the most unlikely, unexpected journey in the middle of a prison, interpreting dreams for them. Crazy, right? It gets even crazier. Two years later, he's still in prison, and Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't shake and didn't know what to do. But you know what he did know what to do? He knew to find this guy named Joseph who was in prison. What happened then is amazing. Joseph interprets his dream, and that's not all. Genesis 41, verses 41 through 43. After the successful interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, he finds favor with Pharaoh. And at this point, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. Talk about this sign of family and trust. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and people shouted before him, Make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Joseph becomes in charge of the whole land of Egypt. What happens? Despite everything that happens to him, all the possible things that go wrong, all the obstacles, all the haters, even his own family, he flourished anyway. How do we navigate the unexpected journeys, even if at some point in that journey we feel like we're a victim to it? We'll just trust in Joseph's story and what happens is that God is not going to leave you. God's not going to see that something happened to you. It's not going to take God by surprise. Oh, I didn't see that coming. Oh, what are we going to do now? No. He knew all along what was going to happen. It didn't mean it was his will, but he knew it was going to happen. He knew how to take that thing that happened to you and to leverage it to flourish you. Trust me when I say this. No matter where you think you are in this journey, how far away you are from the push pins, God wants you to flourish anyway, to bloom where you are planted. Often the detractors are our family and I think the truth is, number three here, God can bless you even if you were forced on an unexpected journey. God can bless you no matter where you are. You can flourish anyway. You can flourish no matter what circumstances have led you to this point. And I think trusting in that and knowing that might give you all the confidence you need to keep going forward. And here's the fourth thing I'll say. Have hope. Have hope in this whole process. God's not done with your family. God's not done with the people who you love the most, who may not be outwardly supporting you or even outright being an obstacle to you. Pray for them. Listen, God's not done with them. What I can tell you is this. Years later, both my brother and sister had experience of God that helped them in their life at the time. My mother came to know Jesus Christ. My stepdad never did. At least, I didn't know if he did. But all I could tell you is, be patient. Have hope. God has a plan for them too. God has a journey that he wants them on. And here's the thing. You might be a big part of their journey. Your decision to keep going, even in the face of opposition. I remember when my mom came to Christ, that's one of the things she said to me. She said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. When nobody supported you, you kept going. You believed. It was real. You didn't give up. Thank you so much for that. So I don't know where you find yourself on the road today, but let's trust God enough to get back on the road again. Let's find God in the unexpected journey because believe me, He is there. 